34-year-old Victoria Murden of Louisville, Kentucky, embodies an all-American spirit of adventure. But with her video camera rolling, her quest to push the limits of her own endurance nearly killed her. I've been thirsty and I've been hungry and God knows I'm scared. Normally, Tori is accustomed to racing on calmer waters. But in October 1997, she was approached by Sector, an Italian company known for its extreme no-limits competition. The challenge? To be the first woman to row solo across an ocean. The proposition was intimidating. To, to row the North Atlantic uh, going west to east is no cakewalk. On June 14th, Tori Murden took the first strokes in a 3,600-mile odyssey from North Carolina to France aboard a 23-foot boat she named the American Pearl. I knew that, okay, in the next three months, it's just me and this boat on this wide, wide piece of water. That is my dessert for the evening. Tori packed 120 freeze-dried meals and a solar-powered desalinator provided fresh water. At the end of 58 days, Tori had rowed more than halfway across the Atlantic. But of all the obstacles she faced, none proved more menacing than the fury of the sea. And I'd been through some pretty heavy storms and capsized three times. I'll take my word for it, these waves are just a little too big. When Tori did capsize, the American Pearl was designed to right itself. And though terrified, her waterproof cabin kept her safe. Big wave would come over the top and it would spin the boat. And then I'd be upside down for a couple of seconds and the boat would rock and then it would eventually roll back upright. I'm outside and I'm alive! For inspiration, Tori kept a piece of home close by. That little flag on that boat took such a beating and it was so comforting to look out on deck in the morning and see that flag still there. But the weather steadily worsened, and while we breathed a sigh of relief as Hurricane Danielle passed by the East Coast on September 5th, Tori was brutally engulfed by the storm. 6.30 a.m., um, I'm definitely in something big and bad and ugly. 30-foot waves slammed into Tori's boat, tossing her like a rag doll. <laughs> Mash into the boat, and there would be this chaos that would ensue, the boat turning and things flying around the cabin. On the last capsize, I took the rib off the top of my ceiling with my uh, back. I was absolutely sure that I was not going to live through the storm. I was absolutely convinced that my life was over. I'm, I'm going to live, I'm going to die on the whim of nature, and um, that's that, huh? Frightened, Tori uttered what she thought may have been her last words. Go ahead and chase your dreams. I mean, they don't always work out right, but go ahead and chase your dreams. You got to do it. Though fear was evident in her eyes and in her voice, Tori resisted activating her distress beacon. And I thought, I can't ask another human being to come out into this storm and get me. I've lost track of the number of capsizes. But after 11 capsizes in 12 hours and a severe shoulder injury, Tori signaled for help. I was so badly beaten that, you know, I, I didn't think I could make it through another storm. The container ship Independent Spirit en route to Philadelphia came to her rescue and plucked her from the churning seas some 900 miles from France. I was fighting back tears because I thought, this is the wrong shore and this is the wrong boat. But the folks in Philadelphia gave Tori a hero's welcome. And I was dumbfounded because in my mind I had failed to do what I, I had set out to do. We all face oceans. We all run into those big waves. We all hit storms. And it doesn't seem like you're going to make it through. You will. The movie Jaws is now a classic, but in real life, this man caught the largest shark ever. He is 43-year-old Vic Hislop. Hislop is a shark killer, a man who pits himself against the man-eaters, capturing them and killing them, afterwards selling the shark's parts. You see, Vic Hislop hates killer sharks. I look at them and I think, what have you done? How many dolphins and whales and seals and have you taken any people? 
You know, I think this, yeah, exactly. His take-no-prisoners approach has greatly upset the Australian authorities. Well, I, I find it, uh, people like that, uh, a bit of an um, environmental menace. Nonsense, says Hislop, who charges that killer sharks are swimming rampant, killing hundreds of people each year. They're multi, multi millions of them. The trouble is we've got goody-goody, right? When they want to prove a point, suddenly saying, now I love sharks, we must save them, they're beautiful creatures. You know, but that has got nothing to do with the sharks that will tear people apart. How many people do you think a year are killed by sharks here in Australia? Hundreds of people a year. Definitely. Really? Oh, definitely. On average, we get uh, approximately uh, one or just under one person per year killed by sharks. They're covering it up. There's, there really needs a big investigation into it. It's incredible what they're covering up. Hislop says the government is afraid tourists will not come to Australia's lovely waters if the shark danger is known. So they classify all missing persons cases on the seas as drowning incidents. Hislop believes most people who turn up missing are taken by sharks. And to prove his point, he took us out to catch a tiger shark he said was lurking close to divers on the barrier reef. As the sun went down, Hislop watched his depth meter to make sure his 30-foot boat did not run aground on the reef. Then, suddenly, a big strike. <laughs> ah! Need a mongrel reel, this I'll tell you. The shark was on the line for just a flash, freeing itself by biting right through the bait. What kind of shark do you think took that bait? It looks like a tiger shark took it. Hislop believed the shark was still in the area, so we waited. And it soon became apparent that Vic was incredibly similar to the Robert Shaw character in Jaws, right down to the shark story. What happened? Didn't see the first shark for about half an hour. Tiger. I bumped into a friend of mine, Herbie Robinson from Cleveland. Baseball player. Well, he'd been bitten in half below the waist. And it was the Kukas family a father and two sons, just a little bit further north. Now, they were actually in an aluminium dinghy in rough weather, and it was swamped, and tiger sharks attacked that dinghy. They put their teeth through the sides of it. First, they grabbed the father as he got washed over a bit, bit him off at the waist. The two sons held the top half of their father, right, until they couldn't hold him any longer. They were exhausted, and they had to let him go, and the sharks got him straight away. And then the eldest son was taken also over the side of the dinghy. It took 20 hours, but early in the morning, Hislop nailed his shark. And you don't have any tears in your eyes? No, I'm not crying, am I? As the shark was being raised out of the water, danger flashed. Another tiger. Ooh, here he comes. The shark was huge and menacing. He circled, then went under the boat. But after a few moments, the shark swam away. And the way I look at it, every one of these that I sent out could save human lives. And so, this modern-day Captain Ahab continues his search-and-destroy missions along the Great Barrier Reef, his obsession with killer sharks growing with every one he eliminates, leaving one wondering just who is the most dangerous creature in these waters. <laughs>